There are a myriad of reasons why the name of Rolex is so popular. Many, even those who aren't necessarily watch enthusiasts, see Rolex as an achievement, a gift you buy or are given at a stage in your life to celebrate a moment, capturing a point in time when you made a success of something or when you reached that goal. Now there are tiers to Rolex watches. You can choose to buy modern pieces. If you're lucky, you'll be able to find the watch and buy it on the same day, but more often than not, you will be kept on a waiting list and might only receive the watch you desire after a year, three years, five years. This is all dependent on the watch you want and the type of customer you are. It all gets very technical. Of course, you could pay a premium price of over 50% for a watch on the grey market, but for the same money, if you have collected a fair portion of modern pieces, your attention is pulled to the rarer, more unique segment of Rolex buying, vintage Rolex. There are a myriad of watches to choose from in the vintage segment. Neo-vintage, pieces that were made around the 90s and early 2000s. Then the general vintage watch that could date back as far as the early years of the 20th century. Of course, some watches are worth more than others in these categories, and it is widely accepted that neo-vintage Rolex pieces are ones that you should consider because of their value, wearability, and future collectability. Then we get to the more museum pieces, the ones that began the trend of steel Rolex collecting, like the Big Crown Submariners, the Paul Newman Daytonas, the Bakelite GMTs. Ironically, some of the most valuable and expensive Rolexes in the world are pieces that were made with nowhere near the same amount of detail, finesse, or technical prowess like today's pieces. They use, for lack of a better word, cheap-feeling bracelets. They are undersized. The paint on their dials have been cracked by extensive sun exposure, the term used is spidering. Other dials have faded to shades of brown. The term used is tropical. Their bezels have bleached. The term used is ghosting. The radium or tritium paint on the dials has corroded the interior, and some of the most sought-after loom plots fade to a creamy caramel color. Essentially, these, most would say defects, are what makes these watches so sought-after. And when you really sit back and think about it, these so-called defects give the watches their unique character. Many consider these early vintage pieces, especially ones that have all of the above traits, ghosting, tropical, spidering, to be piece uniques. We can all agree that these watches are expensive, very expensive, regardless of the category or collectability. But even if we cannot afford them, they are well worth learning about, well worth appreciating for the value they bring to the watch community. But there is an echelon of Rolex pieces that aren't discussed often, and there are a few well-established names that have managed to situate themselves in this bracket. Off the top of my head, Bamford Watch Company are one of them. Next to them is Tempus Machina, two companies that strive to create watches with a touch of artisanal quality. We like to think that the term design has a focus on these qualities, the thought behind creating something that is right, with a sense of purpose, a clear understanding about how to best execute the language of the product. There is a great deal of thinking that goes on behind the scenes in design studios, and you would be surprised, but virtually every element behind the design is discussed, criticized, greenlit, before going into production. It is a very demanding process. Artisanal approaches are slightly different. When we think artisan, we think craft. An approach that is done with more care. Maybe not the most logical or straightforward approach, but one that tries to blend the concept of art and design into one package. So returning to watches, in a similar way to how we see these unique vintage Rolex pieces, some companies strive to take what they were given, modify or change them, either to pay homage to the models from a different time, or create a piece that speaks to their individual identities. Artisans de Genève is one company that I have followed for a long time. Their approach to designing and creating their watches is unique and worth discussing, especially when observing them as works of art. The watches that have really defined them are the Montoya and Barrichello Daytonas, both made for past Formula One drivers. These two pieces share very similar traits, essentially taking a modern reference, the 116520 Daytona, but then removing the dial creating an entirely skeletonized face, also introducing a unique, transparent set of subdials that mount to the movement. And if you look closely, the entire movement has been removed, modified, and refurbished to improve the reading experience. The approach is very simple, and when we look at a watch like this, we'd probably roll our eyes and say that it's too obvious. But there is a difference between thinking it and actually executing the idea correctly. 
there is something special about the approach taken to create an entirely unique modern day toner. The ingredients have been provided, but it's just that additional 10% that completely transforms it and its mechanical landscape. Because the dial is transparent and is secured very subtly to the movement, it appears as if all the components are floating. And all of the mechanisms inside the Daytona give off a stronger mechanical feeling of a racing instrument. The Montoya uses a set of subdials that are differently colored. Each individual hand matches the color of the subdial, yellow, red, and blue. Also note that the bezel is made of forged carbon. For this combination, the model that works best is the fully gold piece. There is a great deal of contrast between the bezel, the dial, case, and bracelet. The addition of the colors on the subdials, paired with the gold body of the watch, really gives it a punch. Then looking at the Barrichello Daytona, we notice that the only emphasis on the subdials is the larger white surround at the 9 o'clock position, highlighting the hours. There are a few red accents used on the piece, but the majority of the watch is black, and so it best pairs with a fully black PVD case and bracelet. See how the movement has been handled at the back of these watches. Just the addition of a clear case back makes such a difference. A few minor changes to the watch has pushed it into a new category. It feels like the presence of the watch has changed completely. Now of course, they are not to everyone's tastes. They are very extreme. As time-telling devices, it could be argued that they are even more difficult to read because of these aesthetic changes. But what I like to think about, returning back to the age-old approach of doing more with less, these watches are able to bring forward the parts that are hidden with the standard pieces. And instead of hiding them behind basic dials, they are brought forward and celebrated. Are the price of these pieces justified? It's difficult to say. They have been made in very limited amounts and can all be considered piece uniques. In a similar way to how the Scuderia Ferrari is stripped of its essentials and sold for much more than the standard car list price, these pieces have the same draw. Speaking more from a designer's perspective, how best could these pieces be explained? It takes a lot of thought, confidence even, to make such a radical change to a piece that everyone knows. Removing one of the key elements that ties the design of the chronograph down and instead opting to bring the mechanics forward, even though it's not exactly practical and competes with the likes of Richard Mill when it comes to dial legibility, I will say that these pieces do resemble a work of art with an added artisanal quality far more than the generic watches we see from the Rolex family. I would like to take a moment to give my sincerest thanks to my Patreon supporters. It shows me that you enjoy what I bring forward as much as I enjoy putting these write-ups together. You all are helping me build this page, and I appreciate it immensely. Thank you. We move away from their recent poster child and look at other pieces they offer. Now, if you remember the different tiers of Rolex collecting that we mentioned earlier, we have modern, we have vintage, and we have the more artisanal pieces. Artisans de Genève take great pride in creating tributes to vintage watches from the Rolex family, and this formula is fascinating. What is the bane of vintage Rolex collectors? Damage, loss of parts. The sheer amount of value of the piece on the wrist deters collectors from wearing the watches, and that is a shame, but anyone would want to be careful when wearing an antique. Losing something like a simple pusher from a chronograph could cost an excess of $10,000 to replace. So, how about taking a modern watch and modifying it to resemble a vintage piece? Simple and effective. They are quote-unquote cheaper to maintain, and ultimately, you are given the wearing experience without the worry. In many ways, it's like owning a Singer Porsche, a car that looks old on the outside, but has the performance package on the inside. Many of the pieces are made to pay homage to the 6239, the 6240, and the 6263 Paul Newman Daytonas. All of these watches began their lives as modern Daytonas, like the reference 116520. Notice the basic architecture of these pieces. The lugs on the cases are polished. The bracelets have polished center links. The crowns have guards surrounding them. Bear those aesthetics in mind. The modern reincarnation of the 6239, known as the Big Eye, really has a great amount of presence. The contrast of the silver dial against the stainless case and the sheer amount of emphasis that is added with the bezel insert and black subdials. Since the watch started its life as a modern day toner, the crown guards have been removed. The original pushers were replaced with the easier to use non-screw down pushers. The lugs have been brushed and completed with a fully brushed bracelet. 
We refer to other models, like the 6263 references. The dials on these pieces are just phenomenal. Everything, down to the batons and the printing, is correct. And the most obvious way to tell that these watches began as a modern Daytona is when you look at the placement of the subdials. They are slightly larger and slightly closer to the center, meaning that it is using an in-house Rolex movement. Another watch that has been a popular showpiece for the brand is the tribute to the 6241 Paul Newman. Fully gold case, simple and effective contrasting dials and bezels. And the one watch that takes the cake is the 6240 Tropical. Not much needs to be said about this piece. It's just beautiful. There are a myriad of other pieces to find, like one of their most recent tributes to the 6536 Submariner with a brown dial and exquisite finishing. And this is where I'd like to pose the question. What is the general opinion of an approach like this? Both genres, whether they are skeletonized Daytonas or tribute pieces, they are modern watches that are modified. The word modified is important. Some remain modern in appearance, others take on a vintage form. Speaking creatively, the first approach is more adventurous, more artisanal, with less thought about whether the idea improves the aesthetics of the watch, and a greater focus to create more with less, utilizing the likes of the movement as a source of visual intrigue. The second approach, this idea of modifying a modern piece to appear vintage, capturing the charm of an older styling without the exorbitant price tag or the worry that comes with it, is brilliant. There are, in essence, vintage watches that are wearable, usable, extremely dependable. Purely aesthetically speaking, they are all gorgeous. Once again, piece uniques. Two different sides of the coin. And what is interesting, upon reflection, is that these separate approaches would appeal to two different types of people. The vintage collectors, and the ones who want a modern watch that is pushed up to the next echelon in the exclusivity sector. So, it goes to show that there are other tiers of collecting, and creatively speaking, the sky is the limit in this wonderful world of bespoke timepieces.